What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the same. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs like the founders of P90X, Atari, Quest Nutrition, RX Bar, and many more, how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Our sponsor today is Rise25.com, which helps service professionals, doctors, lawyers, accountants, coaches, anyone working with clients one-on-one, and they want to shift away from stop trading just time for dollars and shift to one-to-many client work. So go to rise25.com, learn more. You can down, download a free dream product letter, which is basically a business plan on one sheet of paper that helps you see gaps and untapped revenue. Companies like Disney, Apple, the sporting industries all use versions of the product ladder. Check out rise25.com. Today, I'm very excited. We have Nathan Hirsch, founder of Free Up. That's three E's up, which is a marketplace connecting business owners with the top 1% of freelancers. I can attest to that. I have uh, talked to several of them. They are top-notch people. Um, these 1% freelancers are in e-commerce, digital marketing, web development, and much more. They've helped companies like Payability, Shark, and many e-commerce companies with their staffing needs. Over the past 15 years, uh, Nate has built several successful multi-million dollar businesses. In 2006, he founded his first online venture out of a college dorm room, selling and buying student textbooks, and he was able to scale the e-commerce business, bootstrapping from $20 investment to over 30 million of sales on Amazon across a six-year period while serving over 10,000 customers. Nate is really focused on free up, and they've grown tremendously to over 5 million so far. Nate, thanks for joining me. Thanks for having me. So many questions, you know, um, anyone should check out your, the information you put out because you talk a lot about remote hiring and freeing people's time up, which is what any business owner wants. But I kind of want to start early on. Um, what I do notice with using you guys is you are relentless about customer service. Um, you, it just comes across from what you do and the emails um, that you, you're just on top of it. And I know an influence was Firestone. When you were in high school, so I want you to talk a little bit about what did you learn uh, working at Firestone. I love that you did your research. Um, so my parents are both teachers, and they I rebelled for, against teachers hard when you I did. was in high school, um, of course. And so they made me get summer internships. I spent every summer working, and I hated it. It's one of the things that motivated me to be an entrepreneur and never have to work that nine to five job or retail, which is even longer than nine to five and stare at the clock. So one of my first jobs was at Firestone and I got an internship there. I was making 12 bucks an hour. Um, it was actually pretty cool at the time because I was making more than minimum wage. And the cool thing about Firestone is even if you're the lowest level employee there, they put you through a lot of training on mm. customer service. Yeah. They flew me out to Chicago. I was constantly meeting with different managers in different um, stores, different director of ops. I take it seriously, even for an intern. Yeah, like, all about it. Like they, they're preaching it to you. They want every single experience you have with a customer to be really high end. And if you look at the business I've created, and I've never actually had a real job after college, it's all just taking tidbits of what I've learned out my different internship, my different side jobs, and just applying them to a different industry. Um, and that's really what I was able to do, taking the customer service that I learned at Firestone and applying it to Amazon originally, which gave me a huge head start because you see a lot of Amazon sellers that don't understand customer service that get banned really early, um, but then also applying it to free up, which was my own baby, my own creation. What struck you at Firestone with some of the training? What did they, what did they kind of instill in you? So you always hear the saying that the customer is always right, which isn't necessarily true, um, but it's in your best interest to make the cu make sure the customer's happy. And hmm. they always talk about beating the penguin over the head with a hammer. Like someone comes in for an oil change and, and every time they come in, you're just beating them for every last dollar and you're not giving them that experience where they, they want that more long-term play. If you mess up, you take responsibility for it. You make it right. Maybe you lose a little bit of money here. 
maybe you spend a little bit more time here. Maybe you throw in an extra hour in my case or an extra oil change yeah. and you focus on the long-term play. You want people to be there for life and that's how businesses succeed. That's how you grow yeah. a loyal client base. So what have you had to do with FreeUp like in, in relation to that? So you know? with freelancers, you're dealing with real people, right? We, yeah. we have incredible people on the marketplace. They, they make me look really good. 99% of the time, they do an incredible job, and yeah. I, I'm lucky that I don't spend all day dealing with customer <laughs> issues because right. I would go crazy. It's like that Maytag commercial where the guy is bored because there's nothing to fix because their products are good, you know? <laughs> exactly, but, but they are real people, and stuff happens, and even if you take the best freelancer in the world, they're not going to be the best fit. For well, they're also business. not going to make everyone happy. Either. Exactly, it's, yeah. it's impossible, and so, yeah. I mean, in my mindset is, if I can make the client happy and if I can make the worker happy, then I'm happy. So if there's situations where someone hires a worker for a graphic design project and two hours in, they're like, oh, this isn't my style. Hey, here's a new designer. Here's some free hours. Like We're all on the same side here. And, that, and that's really the mentality that I've taken, um, really caring about the client and wanting to grow with them rather than just steal 20 bucks from them and then move on to the next client. It just doesn't make sense. I'm just not interested in doing that. Yeah, you're in it for the long term uh, for sure. And, you know, your mom um, is an entrepreneur, though, right? You know, I know one of your inspirations is her. What did you learn from her? What, what type of business was she? So she wasn't just a teacher, though, right? So she was a teacher that didn't like the way that the school was going and then started up her own Montessori kindergarten preschool. Mm. And the coolest thing that I learned or that I got to witness was – when I was really little, she started this this small pre, uh, preschool kindergarten, and by the time I graduated and she just retired a few years ago, she had moved locations four different times, going mm. to bigger, bigger locations, wow. doing this business, just her, and it was a nonprofit, and she did an unbelievable job. I, I saw the pros where she would move to that big location and get lots of, um, I guess they're not clients, they're moms and dads, of yeah. bringing their students there. Um, but then I also got to see the cons. I mean, arguing over leases or maybe having a down semester where you didn't meet the requirements that you wanted. And I also got to see the long hours that she put in. I mean, there were some days where she wouldn't come home until 8.30 at night. But she really loved what she was doing, and she had a lot of success doing it, and she was passionate about it, and she treated people well. And if you go around the Long Meadow in, in Massachusetts, everyone that talks about her has nothing but great things to say. And, yeah. and if that's not inspirational. I don't know what is. Yeah. So early on, you wanted to rebel because your parents were teachers. So what did you want to be when you grew up at that time? <laughs> oh, man. I went. I wanted to be a writer when I was little, a writer. which is – Completely ironic because I'm an awful writer now. I outsource all my writing work. Um, but once I started working nine to five jobs, I knew I wanted to be an entrepreneur. And one of the main reasons I rebelled was I just didn't feel like – I still don't feel like school teaches you what you should learn. I mean yeah. I spent so many hours learning how to play the cello or learning how to um, – learning science. And I knew I was never going to apply those to my future in any way. Yeah. And, and there was no way for me to opt out of that and focus on – learning more business. I would have taken all those hours and just spent more time learning business. Um, in addition to that, they don't teach you stuff that every person should know, like how to manage your finances, how to invest in the stock market and, and set up a retirement account. And I, I just think the whole school system is backwards. Um, I, I definitely didn't respect certain teachers in the way because I felt like they weren't respecting me. Um, and I kind of always had that mentality that like you can tell me I'm not going to be successful, but I'm going to prove you wrong, and and that's kind of how I went through middle school and high school. Well, your mom had the same sentiments almost because she started her own school, right? I mean, she really thought this isn't working, and she just up and started something. So she, I mean, she, even though you said you kind of rebelled against them, like it's almost like you agree. You're similar in a way, right? Yeah, no matter how much you rebel against your parents, you always wake up one day and realize you're just like them. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, my mom, she didn't like the curriculum. She didn't feel like the kids were being hands-on enough. So she built her own school and built her own curricula curriculum. And, and I'm kind of in that same mindset when it comes to business and, and setting my own path. Do you remember um, early on with your mom, was it hard for her to get students? So the – Farthest back I can remember is she had a good – I'll call them clientele because I don't know what you she, call them. But yeah. She had a, a small clientele. So 
right before that, she she had a little period where she was trying to transition over. But I think when she created her first school, she took a lot of parents um, with her because yeah. the parents were just as fed up as she was. So she yeah. had a good foundation. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. You know, it's the most precious possession, you know, someone has is their kids and then they trust them with, I mean, your mom is probably spending more time with people's kids than they were sometimes. So big decision. Um, the I want to fast forward a little bit, Nate, to your e-commerce business, right? So you're in school. You decide, you know, textbooks are a ripoff. So you decide to start to buy and sell them. At the time, tell me about the landscape of Amazon. Because at the time, it was probably much different than it is now. Yeah, I mean, I got into Amazon at an incredible time. It was mostly books. They were just starting to get onto all these products. I could find any product out there, and there'd be less than five sellers on the listing. And amazing. So it was all about me just finding what I could sell, what I could get a margin on. And I mean, there, there was no vendor in the world that was going to sign up right away to work with a 20-year-old kid um, with no experience. So I started off just buying retail products. I, I'd buy stuff at Walmart. I'd buy stuff. Um, I'd go to deal sites and find every deal that I could and, and kind of compare the the product price to what it was for on Amazon. And, and as soon as I started to build up a reputation, I was able to move on to different manufacturers. But yeah, it, it was a totally different animal. And um, even their policies, I, every year since I started, their policies get, have just gotten stricter and stricter and stricter. When I started, it was like, don't cancel your orders. As long as you don't cancel your orders and we don't get negative reviews, you're good. And now they have 10 different metrics that you are constantly yeah, following, yeah. especially as a dropshipper. So did you ever branch off into different products or did you stay strictly with the textbooks? Oh, definitely. So textbooks was only the, the first six months. Mm. Um, I really thought textbooks would be obsolete right now and that hasn't happened. Um, but I also just didn't want to carry them around. I didn't really have a place to warehouse these textbooks. Um, I also knew I was graduating in a few years, so I wouldn't have access to them. So what, the first products that I had success with, and, and I tried and failed a lot trying to get off textbooks, um, was baby products. So hmm. I was a 20-year-old single college guy drop shipping baby products on Amazon, um, realizing that moms would pay very high prices for, for their kids. And that's really how I started. And um, I expanded into home and, and toys, but um, baby products, home and toys has really been my focus on yeah. Amazon. So I know you still own this business, so you may not be able to answer this question because some people don't want to divulge what they sell, but what are some of those popular baby products that you found were, were good? Sure. So let's see. It's so random. The stuff that I've sold uh, over the years has honestly made very little sense. <laughs> well, one time I, right. I found this bookcase and I was making $25 per bookcase and it was, there was nothing special about this bookcase. It just happened to be high on Amazon and I sold thousands of them. And um, those those little kid laptops, those inflatables that you see during Halloween that um, look really obnoxious. I, I formed a partnership. I still have a partnership with a manufacturer to, to sell a lot of those. Um, it's really – it got to the point where – Back then, there, there was no like optimizing listings. There wasn't all these like strategies. So it was like, hey, let's trial and error everything and see what sticks. And you could find what you think is a really good product and, and never sell any of it. And some random bookcase you found, you sell a thousand. So right now, I mean, someone comes to you. They're like, I want either to start an Amazon business or they have one and they're looking to expand. Where, what uh, categories would you sit, tell them to look at? Yeah, so I, I try to stay away from that. I point those people to the experts. I mean, if you look at the Ben Cummings of the world, which is a great partner of mine, um, the Startup Bros with Will Mitchell, they're the people that specialize in taking you from zero to a million. I'm more there to provide their hiring needs as they yeah. grow to the business to help follow that path. For sure. Um, so your first vacation happened, right? You're running the e-commerce business. What did you come back to? I guess you didn't come back to it, but what happened? Yeah, so I spent, once I got away from books and I had that period where I trial and errored and, and found baby products and all of a sudden I'm growing this multi-million dollar business out of my college dorm room. I was hiring people for the first time. I had no idea what I was doing. I hired someone I called the manager of the day who would do everything from emails to customer service. Spent six months training him. I had one supplier that I finally got to work with me that I was crushing it. We were making good margins. They had, they were good with inventory and shipping. And I had just gotten this business to a great place. And 
I'm 20, 21, making more money than I ever had in my entire life, thinking life is good, let's take my first vacation, I put in this hard work, and life's funny, I, on day one of the vacation, I get a call from the manufacturer saying that they no longer want to work with us, from the manager of the day, who was a college student, saying that they wanted to focus on college and they didn't want to work anymore, so all my training was out the door, and then just to top it off, um, my identity was stolen, and I got a call from my accountant telling me about that, how someone had taken $40,000 in my name from the government. So as a 21-year-old, I now have a stolen identity. So I went from this unbelievable high to this super low, like, let's start over. Do I even want to do this? Do I go out and get a real job? Um, I was still working at Firestone on the side. I was, I think I either had just got stopped with them or I was, I was thinking about getting off with them, and I knew I was going to have a full-time job offer out of college. So it was like, all right, do I go down that path or do I build this entire business back up from zero? And and obviously, yeah, I gave it a head, I gave it a try building it back up. Um, and I took a lot of lessons about d- diversification from that experience. So, what made you decide to keep going with it? It's a good question. I mean, we had we had some money in the bank. It was me and my business partner Connor, and we were like, all right, screw it. Like <laughs> we we've got this much money. We have. These people that we can hire to list products, we have X amount of time. Let's go for it. If we run out of money, we shut it down. And within three to six months, not only were we bigger, but we were more diverse and, and we never really looked back. So, Nate, why did you start free up? You know, the e-commerce thing's going well. Yeah. So one thing that I, I learned as I made this e-commerce business bigger um, is how much time just hiring VAs takes. <laughs> And I had some great ones, and I had some bad ones as well. But I was—I went from spending all my time finding new manufacturers, listing more products, doing creating processes, which is what I really like doing, to all of a sudden I found myself doing interviews nonstop, posting jobs, even in-person interviews. I remember just being in a, in a room interviewing like four candidates in a row for hours, and when they left, I just threw something against the wall, and I was like, I can't do this anymore. There, there's just got to be a better way for me to get access to this talent, and I just never found it. And when I was talking to these other sellers, the other business owners, they all had that exact same situation. They all hated it. There's no one. I, I haven't met someone who's like, oh, I, I love interviewing people. I love HR. <laughs> right. yeah. That hasn't happened yet. No. And no. I just wanted a solution for that, and that's really why – um, I created free up where instead of just posting a job and it's a free for all and anyone can apply, we get hundreds of applicants every week. We take the top 1% based on not only skill, but attitude and communication, let them in and make them available quickly to clients so that they know what they're getting. Um, they're, they know they're getting high talent quick and we also protect them and have that good customer service on the back end like you mentioned. Yeah. It's interesting, you know, Nate, because at first glance, you you know people will probably compare free up to uh, Upwork or one of these other ones, but the reality is it's almost like a high level matching service, right? Because people post a job and they don't have to go out and search. You guys have curated it and then you make recommendations, right, based off of that particular job and the skill sets of people you have in your in your workforce, right? Yeah, and it's very customized. I mean, I have clients that. They, they want to meet five different workers for a ticket. I, I have a client that they just want me to pick one and send it to them. I have clients that the only time I talk to them is when they need something, when they need that next worker. And I have clients that they do need a little bit more hand-holding. Maybe they've had bad experiences and they, or they've never done it before, and we assist them along the way. So it can be as hands-on or hands-off as yeah. you want it to be um, and really fit the mold of any single business. Yeah, and I, w- I want to talk about how you've done that, how you've curated this really amazing workforce, um, which I've experienced firsthand. Um, but I know you, you know, you talk about how to best hire remote employees. And one thing you tell people to write down is their pet peeves. Okay. Right. I'm curious, what are your pet peeves when you're hiring someone for, uh, for free up or for yourself? Sure. I got to correct you, though. They're contractors, not employees. You can buy them out and make them Contractors. Um, yeah. So my some of my pet peeves are – so I get thousands of Skype messages every day, right? Email, stuff like that. Um, so we're talking about my internal team, the people that actually work with me. Um, it, it, I don't like it when people send me a message and then wait for me to respond. So like, 
hey, Nate, I have a question. And then they wait for me to respond before I actually ask them a question because, I mean, you've dealt with me. I'm very fast-paced. I, I respond very quickly. I'm all over the place, and it just takes up more time. Yeah. Um, I don't like having to repeat myself over and over again. If, if I told you something, and obviously if you have questions, ask them. But if I told you last week this is how something should be done, I don't have time to tell you two or three more times. I, I'd rather just move on and get someone that can do it right from the first time. Yeah. Um, most of my pet thieves are all about efficiency. It's all about valuing my time yeah. um, at the highest possible level um, and having people that kind of adapt to me as a client and not just treating me like every single client out there because I'm a very unique human being that runs a business in a very unique way. So they have to be very adaptable to me. So I mean, what are tasks that people would be surprised about that you delegate? Because you're very efficient, on the go, busy, I'm sure you try and delegate as much as humanly possible. I mean, I delegate everything. My social media, the graphic design, the writing for our blog is all delegated. Um, our billing, which we bill this week, I think we're billing $127,000 in revenue, um, $100,000 in revenue, is all done by remote workers in the Philippines. I mean, they're from invoicing to following up with clients, it's all outsourced. It's all systems and processes that um, that we built. I have assistants that monitor my Skypes and email close to 24 seven um, that know how to either respond to high level questions or we have canned responses for basic stuff or they know when to escalate it to Nate. It's like, hey, like let's get Nate involved. It's gonna be much faster if he just solves this real quick. So, I mean, my, my entire life is just about delegating and making sure that my time is spent on the highest possible mm -hmm. um, level and Will Mitchell from Startup Bros is a friend of mine. He always makes fun of me that I'm still taking client phone calls. Like my calendar is right on the free app website. But for me, that's a that's really your highest value thing. task. Exactly. Yeah. What about personally? What do you delegate yeah. personally that would surprise people? What do I delegate personally? Um, I mean, most of the stuff that I'm delegating is just like automatic software, um, it just in terms of like finances and stuff like that. Um, like I mean, an I example, like yeah. sometimes it's an argument a little bit with my wife and I. I don't know if this happens with your uh, your significant other, but because I like to be efficient. And so if I, let's say there's a light bulb out or something, I don't want to change a light bulb. I actually want to wait till there's maybe like five light bulbs burnt out and have someone come and change the light bulbs, right? And that pisses her off. And what maybe pisses off is, is a strong way, but just go up – go up there and just change it. It's not that big of a deal. So I'm curious, I'm sure you're doing this in your daily life and I'm just wondering what you try and optimize in there. Yeah, it's funny. So my girlfriend, uh, her sister married this guy who's like super hands-on. Like he's the guy to change the light bulb after Hurricane Irma. He put this entire fence back up and my mentality is always like, all right, I can just like hire someone to do it. It's like, yeah, I could clean my house, but I'd rather just hire a maid, even though it's going to cost me a little bit of money. It's just, I'd much rather just do something else. I'd much rather like work on free up. It's just not a good use of my time to, to do all these chores. And you're right. It does lead to arguments. Usually I don't win those arguments. Um, but it, it's kind of, yeah, you're always in that efficiency mode. It's like, yeah. is this actually the best use of my time? Does this actually have to be done right now? And, and there's the prioritizing side of it too. I'm sure you have this huge list of everything you want to do over the next year or so, and you can't do it all at once. You prioritize. You're like, this goes before this. And and I kind of do the same thing in my real life. You mentioned the light bulb. It's like, oh, before I, I get to the light bulb, these are the things that I want to do. And my girlfriend has a slightly different list of what the priority is. <laughs> right. Exactly. Um, and the other challenging part about people using free up, I find, is – that there's tasks that people should delegate, but it's hard for them to delegate and it's hard for them to let go. What are things that you right now, you're like, just let go. Like if someone's listening as an entrepreneur, it knows that they have a hard time letting go that you're telling them you just need to get someone else to do it. Sure. The, the two things are customer service and bookkeeping for for years, I, I took my Firestone customer service skills and I was like, I'm the only one that talks to customers. There's no one else that can do it as good as I can. Yeah. This is a good use of my time. And I realized that getting someone in charge of customer service on my Amazon store was one of the best things that ever happened to me. The, the day I woke up and I didn't have to think about customer service emails was just a huge stress reducer. It probably added years to my life. Yeah. Um, and the other side of it is bookkeeping. I spent 
years taking really thick credit card statements and just inputting them into QuickBooks once a month, one by one, not realizing that I could hire a VA to just do all that for me. And I still see people a day that honestly aren't qualified to do that bookkeeping. And, and I'm one of those people as well. Like there are people out there that cost less than what your hourly rate is that can do it better than you can. Yeah. And you can still be in charge of your finances. You can still proofread the work. You can still be on top of it like a good business owner should be. But those are two things you should really get taken off your plate as soon as possible. What's some of the most popular services that people request on free app? Sure. So right now, advertising is just hot, whether it's Amazon PPC, Facebook ads, Google ads, um, even stuff like YouTube and Instagram ads are, are gaining popularity because mm. they, they've been so effective. So that's something that we, we've really seen that that wasn't we didn't really start free up to do that much marketing. And we kind of just went into the demand of it and followed suit. Um, other things, I mean, bl blogging is incredibly popular now. People are always looking for um, top tier writers. Um, I mentioned bookkeeping and accounting, especially with how complicated um, taxes can be. Um, and, and then I guess other stuff, I mean, people are always trying to build their own site. I, we talk about diversifying and not putting all your eggs in one basket and, and selling on Amazon. So people now realize that they can hire someone to, hey, take all my products from Amazon, put them on eBay, put them on Walmart, put them on Jet. Let's build a Shopify store. And it's not as expensive or tedious as it used to be. So those are some popular things that yeah. are just growing. So do you have people who do the YouTube ads and Facebook ads and, and those kind of things? So Definitely. people, I mean, yeah. I hired them myself. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, so when, because you, what was the first version like? Because you, you basically are heavy in e-commerce. The first version, what kind of things did you offer? Uh, it was pretty much just Amazon services. It was, hey, we have people that can help with repricing, with inventory management, with customer service. Um, and with listing. And then Amazon PPC gained popularity, so we added those type of people. Um, and then we had this great group of clients that were like, hey, we have a Shopify store. Hey, we need someone to create this logo for us. And we really branched off from there. Yeah, so one thing that uh, I think is genius, Nate, is that you also can get work from Upwork. You have, a, you have an Upwork profile right? And then people can hire you through that. And there was one, this amazing testimonial that, I'm re that I was reading and uh, it said something about Amazon ungating in food and grocery. And this person wrote, um, they fixed something that I've been struggling with for two months, the hardest thing I've done in my life, and they managed to fix it within 30 minutes, okay? So I'm just curious, is, is this a good method? Like, do you get a lot of inquiries through Upwork? Um, when I started and I was really playing around with it, yes. Um, I wish I could take credit for that ungating. That was way back in the day and, and the worker did everything. I did nothing. Um, well, no, I but, figured most of these are a worker doing something. You're not you doing it, but, but yeah. But yeah, um, no, right now we do about 10% less on Upwork. We have a great relationship with them. Um, we use them on the finding worker side, still around 10%, but we have 700 plus workers. So it's a decent amount of them. Um, or we're probably getting away from it uh, little by little. We want to forge our own path. We definitely don't want to be um, relying on Upwork to get clients or even to get workers. No, and but, but if there's, they're there, you know, you just go where people are, you know, and a lot of people are there, they'll, they'll find you, you know. Exactly. Um, it definitely helped us um, get off the ground a little bit. So one other thing that you talk about is creating questions that reflect your values, interview questions. And... Um, so I want to hear some examples of those. One I really liked that you said was, okay, if someone wants a workaholic, for instance, a question you have is, what do you do on weekends? Like, I would have never thought of that, right? That, okay, if they're saying I work or whatever, obviously that's reflective upon some being a workaholic. So I'm really curious of what other of those kind of value-related interview questions you have. So a lot of my questions are geared towards the outside of the scope that they're working with you. So if you're if you're hiring someone, let's just say an hour a day, you get an hour of your day back. I want to know what that person is doing with the other seven hours in their day. Are they treating this like a part time job and going to school? Because to me, that could even be a red flag. I've dealt with college kids who the second they get a higher paying job, they're out. 
all of a sudden finals come up and they can't commit, which finals happen to be over busy season. Yeah. Um, or do they have two or three other clients? And if so, I, I don't need to know all the information, but I want more information on those. Are you growing with those clients? Are they short term, long term? How long have you been with them? How's that going to affect me? You mentioned like, are, what are you doing for hobbies? Um, are you playing video games? Are you um, hanging out with your family? Are, do you have all these people that are really dependent on you and the second anything happens with any of them like work stops and they're your number one priority so a, a lot of my questions are, are geared towards what could possibly go wrong which a lot of that time is outside that the hours that they're working for you mm -hmm. um, what are the red flags are there that you see because you probably interview lots and lots of people sure so I actually have a recruitment team that does all my interviews now based on my process so right. awesome um, the, the red flags I always look for, so we got the skill, we got the attitude, we got the communication, right? For skill, I'm looking for people that can do what they say they can do. If they, if someone claims that they're the best Facebook ad person in the world, I'm mm -hmm. expecting them to be that. If someone's like, Hey, I'm just freelancing for the first time. I'm willing to work at this low rate. I have experience with Hootsuite, with WordPress, whatever it is. And I dive deeper and deeper. I want to make sure they can actually do what they say they can do, especially because my name's on the line. If I send a worker to you and I'm like, hey, this person has this skill, I'm expecting them to have that skill and only take jobs that they can do at an incredibly high level or at the level they said they could. So a lot of my red flags are diving deeper. If we have an Amazon person, we're asking them different questions. And if we hire a developer, we want to make sure that people are up to date, that people know what what's considered white hat and black hat. And if we see people struggling to answer those questions or stuff that's outdated or stuff that seems like they're they reading it off Google, those are all red flags in the in the skill department. Right. With the attitude, I mentioned the stuff that's kind of going on outside. Um, we're really looking for passion. We want to see people that are excited to be here. I know you, you've met a few people at Free Up, but yeah. It, it's pretty incredible that we have 700 plus people and they all have very similar like energy level. They, they're all very passionate and that's not by coincidence It's because we spend a lot of time vetting out people that we see are just in it for the paycheck that are just about the money that only talk about money. That's only that are only interested in what's in it for them that aren't interested in helping the clients or growing the community or being a part of something great. So that's really what we're looking for for attitude. Um, and communication is everything. Like yeah. if someone has skill and they have attitude, but they can't communicate, there's no point in working with them. It's it's not going to work out. So, I mean, communication. We, there's so many red flags. I mean, showing up late on interviews, disappear, like not disappearing, but long pauses between um, questions. It could be, hey, we asked two or three different questions together and they only answered one of them on the response, which is incredibly common. If you've ever emailed someone like a long email, we want someone who's going to spend the time and answer every single thing because if they don't, then I get CC'd in the email and I get pulled out of what I'm doing and to, to fix the situation. So, I mean, communication is really endless. It's everything from the two rounds of interviews that we do to the tests that they take on our communication guidelines, just looking for any possible red flag that they might not have incredibly high communication skills. Yeah. And I know you have a team probably doing this now, but how have you found such good people? I mean, that's, that's what any business wants, right? To find great people. Yeah, it's an interview process that we took from day one, from when I hired Connor, who's been my business partner for eight years, one of my best hires. And every time we made a bad hire, we go right back to the interview process and we add in this question. We t tweak this question. We add in this part. We add it in the guidelines. We add in the test. We add in this extra round. You, you're constantly going back. And even now when, when we kick people out, out of the network, which is at an all-time low, I can't even remember the last time we did it, but we have, we're like, hey, how did this person get in? How, this person either didn't have the skill, they didn't have the attitude, or they didn't have the communication. Somehow they snuck through our process. We need to add some more layers to make sure that doesn't happen again. And it's really eight years of that to create that interview process that um, you're right. We have a team that does it led by a VA that's worked for me for five plus years. Um, I'm the godfather of one of her children. We have a great relationship. And, and she runs that based on that system that is consistently evolving. Is their middle name free up or no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, so what's been the hardest job to hire for? You know, like people have tried to find this 
this particular whatever skill and you finally cracked the nut and found someone what's been what's been a hard one to hire for developers i mean developers are always going to be the hardest uh they speak a different language uh it's incredibly hard even on their end and giving them credit there's a lot of great developers out there even ones that work with me but giving estimates giving due dates is really hard for them and get in developers that can do that and communicate at a high level and break it down for someone like me that I don't know Node, I don't know JavaScript, um, is an incredibly hard thing to find. And, and when you find those people, you have to hang on to them. And it also requires some learning on on your end of the, from the client side because Connor and I, the way we deal with developers now is way different than we, deal, than we dealt with them back in the day. Um, everything from just breaking it down to not assuming things to – to going over the business logic with them because a lot of times they, they don't have that business background. They're, they're trying to code. So breaking stuff like that down for them very simply um, and really doing more than just saying, hey, I need an estimate. I need this done by this date. Giving them as much information as possible so they can give you informed information. So, But people can get developers on FreeUp currently, right? Absolutely, yeah. 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 Um, I wanted to talk about uh, your partner, Connor, and how do you divide up the roles with what you guys do? Sure. So way back in the day, so Connor and I have a great relationship. Around year four or five, I, I think it's four or five, we started to step on each other's toes a little bit. Um, I made him the CEO of Portlight because um, I wanted to focus more on the operation, so I was the COO. Um, and, and once we did that, we kind of started to step on each other's toes. We didn't know who was doing what. We were giving employees and, and contractors just totally different messages. And we we found this activity online, and we sat out on my porch, and for an hour, we just went back and forth, hey, you're good at this. You're bad at this. Connor's like, you're bad at writing. I'm like, hey, you're bad at running Monday morning meetings. <laughs> and, and brutally honest with each other. Yeah. And at the end of it, we had this list of, pros and cons for each of us and we just realized that we overlapped each other so well and it worked out so nicely it was like i'm bad at writing he's a fantastic writer he wrote our book um so it's been ever since that it's been very easy to whenever something comes up we're like all right who should this go to and it's very natural we almost when we meet i had a meeting with him this morning we pick it up very quickly we're like these are the things you have to do you're taking this i'm taking this and we go forward. And I'm fortunate that I've been able to build that kind of business relationship. Yeah. So Nate, what was something he thought you were bad at, but you thought you were good at? Like writing would be an obvious one where, okay, yeah, I agree, but I'm sure there's some stuff, you know, with, with my business partner, I'd be like, you know, he may say something and most of the time I'll agree, but sometimes like, no, I don't agree with that at all. <laughs> Um, so dealing with remote contractors and dealing with employees is way different. I used to have an office back in Orlando. Yeah. Um, and I, I'm, I consider myself a personal person, I guess. But when it comes to business, like I'm very logical. I'm very like black and white. Like this is the way it's done. Remove the emotional element. And that doesn't always work when you have employees in the office. I mean, people have bad days. They've got family issues, a lot of stuff that I don't have to deal with on the VA side, but right. we used to have an office and something would go wrong or someone needed to be disciplined. Um, he did not think I was good at handling those because I'm a brutally honest person. They walk into the door for the meeting and I'm like, this is what you're doing wrong, X, Y, Z. And to, in my mind, it's like, I just told you the logic behind it, like go fix it, where he has a more personal approach. He's like, how are you doing? Like, let's get more information. Uh, you um, and I think my strategy works a lot better with VAs who, who are very focused on me and we kind of remove that, um, th those personal elements. Yeah, I got it. Yeah, I'm listening to a book, um, Practice Perfect, and it talks exactly about this. Um, it, not that one approach was better than the other, but that even your approach is good because you're specific and most people don't tell people what they're doing wrong. They just kind of let it slide until it builds up. So it's, uh, it's interesting. Like it's good. Yeah. Um, improving culture. Again, you're big on making sure culture is good, even with remote employees. What are some best Contract. practices people should think about? What's that? I'm sorry. Yes. Contractors. <laughs> yeah. So, it's funny. A lot of people, they, they fall into the habit. They, they find all these random people and they put them together and then they're like, all right, this is the culture. Let's build it. Where a much better strategy is you identify what you want your culture. 
is on that spectrum. And then you add people in, fit into that culture. And when you add someone that doesn't fit into that culture, it really ruins the culture for everyone. So half the battle is just getting those right people to begin with. And that's all that attitude portion that we talked about. Yeah. And then once you actually get those people into the culture and you get a bunch of similar minded people in that culture that you built, it's all about consistency and having that same message going from the top down. If Connor and I are talking to, if I'm talking to one person and Connor's talking to another person and we're giving them totally different vibes, totally different messages, it destroys the culture. We have to be on the same page going down from me to my internal team to all the freelancers on the marketplace. And we have to hold people accountable to it. If if someone's a really talented worker skill wise and, and they're destroying the culture, workers want to see that we're taking action. It doesn't mean we kick them out right away, but we're talking with them, we're making we're doing everything possible to fix it. And having that consistency where, hey, this is the culture, this is the way it is, it's not optional, it's part of what we're doing, um, really goes a long way to keeping it long term. Yeah. So Nate this has been fantastic. I wanna. I have two more questions, but I want to encourage everyone to check out FreeUp.com. It's F R three E's E E E U P dot com. They have. I mean, I firsthand experienced uh, just just top notch people, individuals like you're saying, with the skill, the attitude, and the communication, just top notch on all all three. So thanks for what you guys do because you are taking a heavy weight off of business owners. You know, that we should be doing other things and, and leaving the professionals to do whatever it's advertising or web development or not try and, you know, do, um, you know, images that you're not trained to do type of thing. So thank you for that. Um, you know, since it's Inspired Insider, Nate, I always like to ask um, what's been a low moment with, with Free Up and then what's been a proud moment uh, with Free Up? So I'm fortunate with free up. I haven't had the same issue that I had with my Amazon store where I had to totally start over. Um, with a, the kind of the theme of the developers, where hiring developers is hard. Um, we have a developer, Russell. He's awesome. He worked with me uh, at Portlight, works with me on free up, um, built our entire software program. And uh, I think it was end of last year, beginning of this year, we had hired two to three developers and. We, we just realized that we had pretty much wasted three months of developing because the developers, they weren't working well together. The culture between them was awful. They were disagreeing on, on how everything should get done. Um, and, and with Connor and I, we're not developers. We don't really know who's right and who's wrong, which made it incredibly hard for us to, to get in the middle and break it down anyway. So it was like, all right, do we, do we scrap it? Do we get rid of Russell, who's been – a key with for us for a while. Um, do we hire an agency and pay top dollar? Do we go? Do we just start over and hire different freelancers? This was right. This was like right on the edge where freelance where free up was starting to get new developers. So we didn't have a lot of dev options in the right. network. Yet. Um, and, and that was kind of a low. So we we ended up kind of going with our gut and we we're like, all right, Russell's right. Like let, let's kind of stick with him, even though we weren't a hundred percent sure. We got rid of the other developers, and we we got Russell more involved on the recruitment process before we added new ones. Mm. And we look now, and our dev team is rocking. They're crushing stuff out. Our software has never been better. Um, there's always ways to improve, but that was really that low moment where I mean we wasted thousands of dollars on these developers that, that we got very little. Yeah, you were mentioning. Um you know, managing that project is a huge task. Are there certain productivity tools you use? Um, I don't know, like people use Trello or Basecamp or Asana. What do you use to manage like these big projects or staff in general? Yeah, so I'm glad you mentioned that. I left that out. So we also got Jira. I always print out, I think it's Jira or Jira. Yeah, I, yeah, I know what you're talking yeah. <laughs> Um, but yeah, we started using that afterwards to keep everyone on the same page. And then we also hired a Filipino quality assurance manager that knew dev a little bit that would go through and test stuff that would that they were in charge of Jira so that Connor and I didn't have to get involved in that at all. And it's never been better. It keeps everything organized. The devs know what's assigned to them. They know to pass things to um, staging before to get tested to go to production. Um, so that's really what we set up. Um, I use Trello for just personal day to day stuff. Um, I have it divided up between uh, long-term projects, short-term projects, podcasts I want to get on, influencers that I'm talking to and trying to close, um, and then just video ideas. I have a whole section for that that I throw in there and check off once I do them. Yeah. Um, and on the flip side, Nate, uh, proud moments. 
Yeah, so our goal going into this year was if we hit 5,000 hours filled in a week, we were going to celebrate and take a trip out to the Philippines to meet everyone. So mm. we hit 5,000 hours um, halfway through this year. We're actually, I'm hoping to break 10,000 hours this week. I'm, I'm going to look at the numbers um, after I get off this call with Congrats. you. Congrats, that's awesome. Thank you. It ends at 6 p.m. today, so we got two hours. Uh, but So we have a trip planned in March, and we got to celebrate with everyone, and it was just a proud moment. I mean, we built this from strat scratch with um, no investment with an amazing group of people and just got to celebrate it with everyone. Yeah. Nate, I want to be the first one to thank you. It's been fantastic. Everyone should check out freeup.com with three E's. Anywhere else we should point people towards online to check out? Yeah, I mean, check out the Free Up blog. We post a lot of great hiring content there, even if you're not ready to hire just yet. Uh, right at the top of freeup.com is my calendar if you ever want to book a meeting with me. Um, and if you sign up and you mention this podcast, you get a dollar off your first worker forever. Nice. Um, Jeremy will have a, an affiliate link there. Um, and yeah, I mean, I'm here to help. So feel free to reach so, out. I'm pretty I guess last help. last thing, you know, Nate, um, who is, I mean, who is perfect to start using FreeUp? I know we talked about, you know, e-commerce people with different tasks. Do you want to expand on that at all? Who would be a good fit to start using your services? Yeah, I mean, business owners in general, obviously e-commerce, but we work with real estate agents and business coaches and even brick and mortar stores that are looking to build a website or hire a marketer. Um, agencies that constantly are, are contracting work out, um, we're a very quick source of talent, so we help people um, grow their agencies. And then just influencers, if you have your own base, not only can you hire workers for your business, but you can make a lot of money at our affiliate program by telling your community about it. We have great content we'd love to share um, with you. And we're on pace to pay out over $150,000 this year from our affiliate program. Well, yeah, because there's a lot of cool use cases um, when you go on with, obviously, various tasks uh, with e-commerce or just someone running their business. I mean, anyone needs accounting stuff, I would assume. So, There's very few businesses that can't benefit from hiring virtual assistants. Yeah. Nate? Thank you so much. Greatly appreciate it. And uh, everyone check out freeup.com. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand.